afternoon and good evening. I think this. I think this. A good day to all of you who have registered for the great webinar from different countries and want to witness the great session happening today. Good day from AI Course 40 to everyone. Hope you and your family are doing safe. Today is the great webinar we are going to see, which talks about emerging technology and innovation in logistics. And we are really excited to host this. Now to begin with, let me introduce myself and the company to you. My name is Nitin Naveen and I'll be your host for the day. I'm working as Vice President Innovation Strategy at AI Core Spot, and I have great experience around a couple of decades in the consulting firms, dealing in and around the emerging technologies. Further, I've been joined by my colleague, Arvind and Naveen, who will also assist me in keeping the event lively and resolving the technical glitches if it comes in between. So thanks a lot to them for putting in hard work and making this one a great success. We'll try to provide a seamless experience to all of you so that you can gain maximum output out of the same. Let me provide a brief background to all of you about AI Core Spot. We started a couple of years back, backed up by InfoVision, who is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, who is our technology partner. Our mission is to serve as a hub for information regarding Industry 4.0 technologies. The focus is to provide all of you a deep dive in all the sectors wherever technology is there. And every month, the theme is different. Also, we are gaining momentum month on month. Our aim is to be number one AI-driven community all over the world so that like-minded people like you can be part of the same in supporting, growing, and making it a success. The focus is to do industry-backed webinars and hybrid events. The knowledge base will be made from reliable data through industry leaders, subject matter experts, thought leaders, and our partner, InfoVision. We'll enrich the content through digital content, blogs, podcasts, videos, and newsletters to shed light on the ever-evolving industry. Today, we are having a lovely and unique webinar around the great theme, which lays emphasis on importance of emerging technologies and innovative solutions in logistics. So if you want to know technologies that are changing the future of logistics, upsurge of robotics in logistics, role of technologies like IoT, big data, cloud comp computing, and so on in the logistics space, and much more than you are in the right space. We'll go all over it throughout the panel discussion and give lots of insights to you. There are lots more in store for next month with focus on different technologies like AI, ML, blockchain, IoT, AR, VR, digital twins, metaverse, quantum computing, and so on. So request all of you to go through our website, which is aicorespot.io for future updates. Also, please like our social media handles, which will keep you all updated on everything what we propose to offer in the coming months to follow. Before starting with the day, I would like to highlight a few things so that it can set up the tone for amazing learning and networking day. Special mention about our knowledge and innovation partner, which is InfoVision, and who has supported us since beginning and provided us the right platform to bring the community together. InfoVision is an end-to-end -end IT and business service provider specializing in providing technology transformation and innovation projects for over 25 years across multiple industries and serve 12 global locations, including US, Latin America, Middle East, and India. They also have a unique state of the art and research and innovation lab named Digit7 in Richardson, Texas with five great innovative products. So to get in touch with them, kindly log on to the website, which is infovision.com and leave your details through the contact us section. Now coming in and moving to our community partners for today, it include three great companies, NFI, American Expediting, and Juris, who came together to make this webinar a success. A special mention to attendees of the event who registered and came together to achieve their objectives through this forum. At the end of the day, if you gain few things out of this or get to network with each other, our core objective as a platform will be achieved. Further, if anyone wants to ask questions, they can type it in the Q&A section. You can type in as and when the panel member speaks, and we'll try to get it answered as per the time permitted. Now, quickly, let me hand over the stage to TD, who is AVP handling logistics domain at InfoVision, and who is the moderator for this panel discussion as well. He's joined by great leaders, Dennis, who is director of warehousing operations at NFI, 
Kirk, who is VP Enterprise Technology at American Expediting, and Paul, who is Director of Operational Excellence for Packaging and Customization Services at Geodes. So over to you, Thierry, to begin this exciting panel discussion. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, oh, awesome. So thank you, thank you, uh, Nitin. I'm really excited to be here, be part of this great panel. You know, a uh, quick word about myself. My name is Tirth Shankar Das. Please feel me to address as TD. Um, I work as an AVP at InfoVision. As uh, <clears throat> Nitin mentioned, we are a Dallas-based IT services company focusing on digital transformation and AI, ML, and advanced analytics-led innovation. I personally take care of a lot of customers in the retail and logistics side. We have seen a lot of challenges in the last few years, starting from the pandemic to other global events affecting the global supply chain. You know, So we would like to know from our fellow panelists what are the disruptions that they have seen and how they're using technology to address some of those disruptions. Looking forward to a very exciting conversation. I would like the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with you, Kirk, uh, and then Denise, and then Paul, if you can introduce yourselves. Uh, and then I can have a few questions from my end that I would like to, I would like to ask each one of you. Uh, let's start with the introductions, please. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Kirk Sargentson, uh, American Expediting. I'm the Vice President of Information Technology for North America. We're um, focused on life sciences, so you can see our tagline at the top, improving lives one critical shipment at a time. So it's a different type of logistics, um, a, a very altruistic, um, you know, doing good work to make sure people stay healthy and um, get, you know, um, life-saving medications or organs uh, for, for use. Um, I've been in the industry for 25 years. This is the first time I've been in the life sciences division, but um, very much enjoying it. I'm fairly new to the organization, been here three months, and we're embarking on a pretty significant digital transformation. So that is uh, consuming a lot of my time. But uh, thanks for having me, and it's fun to be here. Thank you, Kirk. Over to you, Dennis. Right, good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis Cheda. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, Director of Operations for uh, NFI. I've been in the supply chain uh, industry for the last 17 years. I uh, started my career off with uh, uh, Walmart Logistics. Um, currently with NFI. So NFI, a little bit about our company. So we're a fully integrated North American supply chain uh, solution provider. Uh, we're headquartered out of Camden, New Jersey. Uh, privately held, uh, we have the uh, own and operate more than 70 million square foot uh, warehouse and space in North America. I'm sorry, am I getting some? Are you, can you guys hear me well? Okay. Yeah, we can. We can hear you fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, again, uh, NFI. So we got a dedicated fleet that consists over 5,000 tractors and 14,000 trailers. Uh, we uh, have a, a footprint uh, covering North America, including Canada. Uh, fourth generation right now that's running the business. So uh, a fully integrated North American supply chain and, and definitely a, uh, uh, a service provider here in the area. Uh, very pleased to be here today and to uh, share a few thoughts and most importantly, learn from, uh, from the other panelists uh, about the technology in the supply chain and, and its important role today. Thank you, Dennis. Over to you, Paul. Uh, yes, my name is Paul Ware. I'm the Director of Operational Excellence uh, for the Packaging and Customization Services. I'm currently working with GEO uh, Logistics. Uh, we actually deal with uh, a pretty wide range of export services across the supply chain, such as freight forwarding, cross logistics, um, distribution, express, and uh, road transportation. Um, and also, we, we focus on supply chain optimization. So. Um, I currently have a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering from Tennessee State University. I have a, a master's degree, uh, an MBA from Middle Tennessee State, and I have a, a certified lean of Six Sigma Black Belt. Um, I have some pretty extensive experience as it relates to all, all pretty much all different industries. Um, started off with uh, right past the first base. Um, from there, I ended up working with Coca-Cola, and then I worked with C.H. Gunther. Um, 
they had uh, trailers from there, the Miles of Packaging and the Logistics. So, um, my expertise actually deals with uh, a pretty good track record as it comes to uh, coming up, cultivating changes and reducing downtime by mitigating waste, which helps to overall uh, improve everybody's output of productivity. All right, thank you, Paul. Appreciate the introduction. So let us begin this discussion. As I mentioned at the outset, right, in the last few years, we have seen a lot of challenges owing to supply chain challenges, congested ports, labor shortage, uh, owing to the pandemic and other global events. So I'll pose my first question to you, Denise. What impact did pandemic have on you have on your business and how did you handle some of this using technology? And, and that's a, a great question, right? So if we look back at the pandemic and what it uh, what it did to the entire supply chain and the logistics, it is uh, it forced the need for technology. Uh, it, it it you know whether you look at it from a labor shortage, whether you look at it from material shortage, right? The lead times became known. Uh, everybody wanted their products uh, now and then, and in the uh, Un, uh, unknown aware of the product and when it was going to come, I think created a lot of opportunity for the organizations to start looking at uh, their operational flow, their sourcing, their uh, their needs, of how their links of the supply chain were tied together to be uh, reinvented. Right. So during that time, uh, we saw technology coming into the Right. So uh, whether it's through uh, robots being introduced into the workforce, right? To to uh, get into the or, or not necessarily replace the, the uh, humans uh, that were doing the work, but more so to uh, serve as a gap or, or to serve as a bridge to close the gap in between uh, any non-value added services that were being done uh, by by humans at that time. Uh, being able to introduce the the uh, robots, right? Phantom Auto is one of the companies that uh, uh, became very popular during that time that NFI has a partnership with to where uh, through remote ability right now, you can perform work anywhere in the world by leveraging the part of technology. Um, again, the pandemic as well, uh, due to its restrictions, brought up the need, uh, if you think about it, in the food service business, uh, how do you provide that the service and the product to a customer without any interaction? Uh, I had the opportunity here about four months ago or so to uh, visit James Madison University right down in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I lived there for a while. And as I'm driving through campus, you got this uh, box robots that are pretty much navigating and driving or, or walking right on the on the. Uh, sidewalks along the students, right? And then their sole purpose is to uh, go from one section of the cafeteria straight to the dorm, right? They're, they're literally navigating the street. Uh, order gets placed from the student. The, the, the robot goes to the cafeteria or to the restaurant close by. Food gets placed into it. Uh, that delivery gets made and gets taken to the student. A code gets put on the on the phone and there's your food, right? So these things are moving right alongside and, and uh, part of the pandemic, right? How do we get uh, the product and the service through created that need for technology and it's thriving. It's, it's uh, it, it was a very interesting concept to see, but uh, that's what I'd say. I think the pandemic forced everybody to think differently and not necessarily for, uh, to, to again, to replace the human aspect of it, but to, see how technology can be introduced in the day-to-day -day flow of the operations in whatever part of the supply chain you might be to not be as reliable to uh, or, or to constrict yourself if you will to one source of, uh, of, of uh, resources and that's that's what i think the pandemic enhanced uh, the technology piece in the supply chain no, I appreciate the insight. <laughs> I appreciate the insight, Dennis. Right, and I will come back to you to for further thoughts on this this side. Right, especially the impact of technology on people. That can it be considered as a threat to people? Right, to to human workforce. But I'll come back to you. But you talked about innovation, right? Using robotics, for example, to address some of the labor shortage issues. Right. So I will move over to Paul. 
So this is, we're talking about innovation here, right? So what are the things that we should consider while implementing innovation and what specifically people don't consider when it comes to innovation? What have you experienced, Paul, in, in your line of work? That's a good question. I think the, for, for me, I think one of the things that people don't consider is um, they don't really have a, a good solid strategic plan. Um, which actually is caused by a lack of pro lack of process analysis. Um, and what I mean by that is that they're not actually defining what the actual problem is, um, which that actually leads to uh, a cause and effect issue. Um, so the way that I feel that it it actually affect the, it will affect the process, you know, such as like what changes that actually need to be made that to the process to adapt to the technology that we're going to be used. Um, if we don't do that to understand how it's going to change the process that we're currently using, then that process, that project will fail because we're not changing the mindset of our people and the behavior change as well. Um, in addition to that, I feel like a lack of co cooperation from internal and external customers, um, that plays a, a big part, as well as, uh, you know, work understanding what functional groups will be affected by the implementing changes and how can we uh, how can we work together to make it as seamless as possible. So based on that, I do think that um, companies as a whole has a have an issue of sustaining processes and procedures. And the, the key to, to doing that is actually developing a good training plan across the board and to help to uh, with the with the labor market that we have currently, we all uh, we, everybody understands that there's a lot of turnover that goes on, as well as uh, people changing departments for a uh, different reason. So we got to make sure that we're training our people to be successful, and we're leading teaching our coach, lead teaching coaching our people to be successful. Thank thank you thank you, Paul. Appreciate the response. Right. That to further expand on this, let me go over to Kirk. So. What in your idea, in your experience, uh, on successful, you know, create successful innovation? What have you experienced in your line, you know, and especially since you're in a very critical supply chain, it, you know, uh, improving people's life and life sciences, right? So, what is your experience in terms of the best way to implement a successful innovation? So, so first of all, I'll say to Paul and to Dennis, bang on. <laughs> I agree with everything you're saying. It's funny when you get on these calls and people sort of explain what they're going through, how much it relates, because I think we're all, we all have similar issues. But um, for me and, and my organization, one of the big things I think that helps with innovation is engagement. We take for granted um, how much our users, our, our customers, um, our internal support staff have come with, with technology. I mean, um, just, you know, kids are growing up knowing technology far more than we ever did. So part of there's, there's two sides of that. I think just to, to build on what Paul was saying, the change management aspect, I mean, the more you can get out in the field and work with people and engage them in the solutions really helps with change down the road. Cause they feel like they're part of the solution. Therefore they're more apt to, um, to engage with it a little more aggressively. Um, also, you know, people talk, Hey, I was involved in this project and it starts to generate some enthusiasm across the network. I think also though, there's some great ideas out there, right? So when you talk about innovation, it can't just, it can't just sprout from one spot, right? It can't just be IT's idea or whomever's idea. Um, I think the more you can engage across with that, you know, new technology, technology understanding from your workforce, um, really working to solve their needs, I think the better your innovation uh, becomes. But you know, just to harken back a little bit to what Paul was saying about process, which I totally agree with, is you can't just go around and, you know, hey, well, give me some good ideas. There needs to be a good, um, well thought out process of engagement and making sure that you're, um, you know, focusing on the right areas and, and getting the right uh, amount of input for that particular innovation. So, you know, I think more from, I think my take is more from a people perspective and engagement and making sure they're part of the solution and they're not just um, consuming whatever you think is the right idea. Absolutely, absolutely. So you're focusing on collaboration across across the entire business, right? Across the business, across ID, involve people in the decision making, take inputs, you know, look at the business problems and try to solve the problem together, 
the site. Right. So in a very controlled that, and process oriented environment. Right. Have toll gates in place and all that, right? Once you start implementing. So uh let me let me go back to Paul uh again. So what causes a lack of cross-functional, uh, you know, uh, collaboration during innovation, right? Where you are implementing, implementing, you have a, you have a, you have a roadmap. Right? You want to know what you want to achieve. You want, you want to know what innovation you want to bring in, right? So, what causes the lack of cross-functional collaboration? You know, because sometimes things don't go as well, right? There, there are roadblocks, there are issues, you know. So, what causes that, and how do you overcome it? Yeah, I think the, the I think that's a good question, and the answer to that question is the how to overcome it is truly getting everybody buy-in, right? So, and getting everybody on board with the, the new process and understanding, get, collaborating with everybody to understand how this is going to affect you. Now, I think what causes uh, some of the the alignment issues that that you have are a few different things. And so you have uh, I think you have some lack of commitment from certain individuals and some people, certain processes, um, which that just basically means a lack of clarity or, or you know, you get buy a uh, lack of buy-in from team members to, to, to from making that decision to stick to it, to stick to it. Um, Avoid is accountability. I think that's another key one that actually contributes to it. Um, and what I mean by that is really just the discomfort of holding people accountable to the new behaviors of this new process and for the performance. In addition to that, I do feel that um, there is a big fear as it relates to, to that. So I think that the next thing I would probably say is people having a fear of losing their jobs to innovation. And in a, and last, I would probably say emergency. So if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So not being able to come up with a mitigation plan for issues that are that's gonna occur, um, understanding how you can poke up certain situations because of because you, you, you have this issue multiple times a day. I think those are the key things that actually uh, cause a lack of collaboration. Thank you. I appreciate the insight, insight part, right? So let me switch gear a little bit and go back to Dennis, right? Previously, we talked about how, you know, how you bring in innovation, how you bring in, bring in, bring in technology to solve some of these issues. And as we go down that path, right, what is the impact on the human workforce? Would you, would, 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 should we consider technology as a threat to jobs? What is your opinion? What have you seen? Is it an enabler or is it something that we should be, we should be, you know, concerned about how it impacts the human workforce. So on the contrary, um, I, I don't think technology being introduced in the workforce uh, is viewed as a threat. However, to what just Paul just mentioned, right? I think oftentimes we, we have this idea as a corporation of an innovation or a technology that we want to introduce, and maybe we jump straight into the what and the how we're going to get that implemented, right? Because as stakeholders, if we have not identified the entire group of who's going to sit there, uh, we might just kind of run with that idea. We see the benefit. We've done the ROI analysis and it makes through. But sometimes pausing and giving that big why and introducing the all the stakeholders, right? So starting from the floor level all the way to where, where it is throughout the entire chain and giving them the why, I, I truly believe that technology will serve as a tool instead of a threat to the workforce. And, and if we look into some examples specifically, uh, automation, right? When we think technology in the supply chain world, right? We think the, uh, uh, auto, like the, the, out, the machines that are driving themselves, right? You got the AGVs, you got uh, 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 self-guided uh, cars that are going back and forth, right? Without any human interaction. And if you think of that, then you're kind of like, well, that's taking someone's job. I think the, the purpose of technology in the supply chain world, right? So if you were to look at the supply chain from order management all the way to the, to the end user or the service of the product being delivered, the idea is to introduce the technology to remove any redundant uh, movements, any non-value. So as you do a, a full uh, 
study of your supply chain or of your value add chain, if you will, removing and replacing some of those redundant, maybe physical, maybe uh, uh, too cumbersome processes with technology and helping that aid in the process will be a very complementary process to the human beings that are working alongside of it, right? And we see that, uh, again, technology, not just in automation, but if we think about IoT, the Internet of Things, right, enabling the use of sensors, just being able to place information through, it can give anybody in the supply chain from a procurement world, we think about pandemic, we didn't know necessarily where our, where our sources or our, our widgets were coming so that we could make our product. Uh, by having the sensors available and having the Internet of Things allow us and help us, we can quickly make rapid decisions and then come back and do some analysis and say, hey, we need to source the product from here and there because our lead time is taking longer or vice versa. And companies like uh, Volvo, if you think about a manufacturing plant, right, you've got sources and all sorts of components that need to come together to create the final product. By having the Internet of Things be part of the solution as the technology within your chain, not as a threat, right, but part of the solution, you now have full, full visibility to where those parts are when they're anticipated. Therefore, you can make better decisions in your supply chain so that you can ultimately, all we're doing in this world, right, in the supply chain and in industry, we're trying to satisfy that customer. We want to provide that service and the product to them in a matter when they want it, how they want it, what they want. And, and do that in a manner to where they become a repeat customer. So the Internet of Things, right? Predictive analytics, being able to, you know, we, we talk about forecast a lot in our world, right? So forecast is never accurate. Uh, being able to look at data and have touch points and technology introduced through your chain can help us make better decisions. Uh, again, not as a threat, but as a tool could also be augmented reality. Uh, Google Glasses allowing someone to pick uh, the order management process, right? Looking through and seeing, okay, what decisions are being made for this product to flow through? What's the demand and what's the supply and how much of that is reliable on one person to go through and smooth that spike on the demand, right? Or what or, or does our technology look at all the factors and the variables and helps that person make a better decision so that we can carry what we need, when we need it, and be able to deliver that when the customer needs it. So uh, my, my thoughts and my opinion is that technology is a great tool that will assist the workforce versus being viewed as a threat. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to make sure that we're focusing on why the technology is being introduced and heightening the benefits that it will uh, give to our to our customer in the tail. Right. Th thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. So to summarize, right? Your, your viewpoint is this is not a threat to the human workforce, rather an enabler, right? It complements the human workforce by making the system more efficient, right? Whether it is the, you know, order to, you know, um, order to cash or procure to pay processes, you know, remove the inefficiencies, make it more efficient, and then analyze the data to make better decisions. This is where you see technology playing a role, right? So my next question, and I'll go over to Kirk for this, and keep in mind the global challenge that challenges and unforeseen outside the control of the business, right? That we have seen over the last few years, whether it is the pandemic or the war in Ukraine, you know, other even global events affecting the you know supply chain. So where keeping in mind those challenges and the advent in technologies, IoT, AI, ML, AR, VR, right, advanced analytics capabilities, you know, access to petabytes of data, right? Keeping in mind all these technology innovations and the global challenges that you have seen in the last few years, where would you invest? If you had money to invest, right, where would you invest money in terms of using technology to make your business better? Yeah, I think in the context of that question, absolutely would invest in big data. I think, um, you know, even to, to Dennis, Dennis's point around, you know, will technology make things better? I think, I think people get scared when they, um, when they see automation because they go, well, there is my job. But it needs to be taken in the context of a broader sort of strategic plan, which, you know, I think that, um, that Paul was mentioning earlier that, that you need a holistic strategy that encompasses all the different innovations you're working. And I think when when you take them from an individual level, people get scared, but when you put it to a broad sort of bigger strategy and you say, look at, we're gonna be efficient over here and you 
you know, there's obviously going to be some labor savings, but there's going to be growth over here. And, and I think that's the balance of, 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 of bouncing of the fear is that holistic view of where we're going as an organization. But to bring that back to big data, I, you know, I think that is the key to making adjustments in your supply chain or in your organization to combat new global changes, right? Is being able to get into the data, um, constantly be looking at how your business is operating, finding nuances within there that can help spur the growth that, you know, as you get more efficient as a business, you're able to inject more capacity and more profit, and therefore you can you can have a, a larger workforce, right? So I think that big data is that area I would invest in, especially in the context of global change, simply because it's it's like the secret key to knowing um, where growth lies and where optimization lies within your organization. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> and to further expand on this, right? As you make those investments, right? what drives the decision regarding to buy off the shelf products or build what what drives that decision um you know i think that's a big uh i think somewhat conundrum in the industry in that you know today there's a lot of commoditization of technology that's happened you know um people or companies are coming out with new ideas and new technologies that help help you facilitate your business I think for me personally, and I, and you know, I'm to be fair, I'm in private equity, right? So we're private equity back is that um, if everyone bought everything off the shelf, then, you know, where are you really competing? There's gotta be some, some special sauce that your company's bringing to your customer base for them to want to engage with you. So, you know, I think, I think my rule of thumb is if something's commoditized, like a transportation management system, I would never build that. I would, I would literally buy that off the shelf. But I think there are um, pressure points within an ecosystem that provide a lot of innovation. Um, I think specifically around mobile. I think mobile, um, I would never buy a mobile program off the shelf. I feel like uh, that is a huge source of innovation. It's really can be a control for your drivers. It's your driver's experience. It's your customer experience. And again, the devices are changing all the time. And so you wanna innovate as that technology gets more powerful, as you can connect it to different aspects of the ecosystem. It also, it's it's a collection point for data to go into your data warehouse. So I know I built a few programs and, you know, saying to my organization, just, you know, relax, like, we're not just gonna build what we just built. Let's take some time and go through the data points you wanna collect through the mobile program from the drivers so we can get better analytics on the back end and how to improve our service. But people just look at, oh, this is what we did last time. Let's just do this again. And I'm like, no, no. Like we want to, this is where we're going to innovate because it's, it is such a innovative platform. So um, if I were to summarize something that's highly commoditized, like a backend system, there's no sense building that. I would buy that, but um, areas like mobile or the customer experience, those are things that I would want to build to make them special because that's what the customer sees. That's what they feel. And you want to bring a differentiator to the marketplace to make sure that you've got a good growth engine. So, so we talked about your focus areas, right? Big data is a focus area, right? And if you have to buy versus build, one of the examples that you have given is mobile is the area where you build because there's a lot of scope of customization and innovation there, right? So moving along those lines, Paul, what is one of the major driver and roadblock in, in terms of obtaining data, right? Uh, so when you do that, when you go down the line of innovation, when you, when you invest in technology to make your business better, right? What is one of the major driver as it relates to obtaining data for your, for your innovation, uh, you know, for your innovation initiative? I think to kind of piggyback off what Kurt was mentioning earlier, I think one of the key drivers, I mean, there are a few drivers, but I think one of the key drivers is data, data quality. Uh, ensuring that you're actually um, looking for the correct information based off the information that you receive. <clears throat> In addition to that, what causes some issues as it relates to that is actually the ownership of the data. So who's going to be pulling the data, how consistent is it going to be getting done, um, how are we going to be looking at this, and how are we going to be reporting it going forward. Um, I, think that, I think that some key information that causes some um, disconnect as it relates to in, in data integrity. Um, in addition to that, uh, external, uh, lack of external data. So we ask our customers for in, information and 
they're not able to provide it because they never collected the information. So that makes it hard for us to justify um, any type of ROI. So for example, um, uh, AVG or anything of any, or Google Glasses because um, some certain information that we need from our, our clients or customers, they're, they're not able to provide as well. Um, and also not being able to actually interpret the data, the, the data correctly. So um, actually getting the right people in the right places to actually identify what this information actually means. So a simple example would be understanding the difference between revenue versus revenue per case. You know, that's something that, you know, that we as individuals need to make sure that we're understanding so we can make sure we're making the, the right financial decisions. Um, and last but not least, I'd probably say that the, the, the last thing that everybody, that we have a tendency to do is um, analysis paralysis, right? So we want to make sure we get so many data points, so, many, so much time. We want to give six months or 500 data points. I mean, you don't really need, need all of that. Um, all the time. I mean, sometimes you might need it, but sometimes you can just pull the trigger because you know it's going to be a good investment. So I would probably say that those are some of the, the, the major drivers of roadblocks that are released. Really so, so thank you. Thank you, Paul. You know, uh, I appreciate that insight. So moving over to Dennis and just along, continue along the same line, right? So what are some of these factors that I asked Kirk and as I asked Paul, right? What are the what are some of the factors? Why do you invest? You know, and if you if you have money, why do you invest to make your business better, right? So along the same lines, what are the drives? What are the factors that drive the need of technology in your business? Uh, uh, again, keeping in mind that today's context, right? Uh, what are some of the factors that would drive the need for technology? So factors that would drive the need for technology. I, I like what Kurt and Bob both said, right? So again, starting with the end in mind, right? What uh, uh, when it comes to innovation and introducing technology, you want to understand the why, right? You want to understand what is it that I'm going after and, and why am I doing what I'm doing? So uh, when it comes to the entire supply chain, I think starting with the end in mind and keeping the, the customer needs, and all of us here on this call today, at some point, we're customers, right? We're customers of a service. We're customers of a product that's being done. And our behavior is forcing the need for technology, right? So if you think about the two-day shipping of the Amazon at one point, that was a disruptor. That was a, uh, a, a change in the supply chain world that forced everybody to adapt to that technology. Being able to ship product within two days that now is a thing of the past, right? We want groceries in 10 minutes. We as consumers have changed our behaviors, right? And we have become so, so uh, impatient on those behaviors to where uh, not only do I want groceries on 10 minutes, but I want the software that I'm using to tell me what my trends are and what, what is it that I'm using the most through the week. And tell me so that I don't have to think about what I want for next week, but I want the system to tell me, here's what you've bought. Hey, based on your health diet that you're going through, here's what we recommend. This store has it. We can fulfill that order. It'll be at your dinner. So it's eliminating the thought process too. So again, starting with the end in mind, us as consumers, we're driving that. So if you take that, that uh, optimal desire of what we're solving for, that stresses and stretches the supply chain. That requires us to be able to quickly identify that order process and not just enter that order, but how do I pick it? How do I pack it? How do I uh, source it? How do I package it? And how do I get it out? Because the consumer is becoming impatient. So with, with that in mind, those are some of the factors that will continuously challenge the supply chain to apply new technology because again, uh, the traditional methods of handling the product flow or the service, if you will, through each link of the supply chain are going to quickly become outdated because the customer demand has rapidly changed. So with that change in mind, factors, those factors and benefits that come out of it, right? Why the need of technology is, well, I need to ship the product faster. I need to avoid any returns or any damages or any errors. Therefore, I need more technology that's going to be able to allow my uh, worker, if you will, to be able to accurately touch that product once, get it done on time, and get it out of there. 
fewer returns? Uh, how do you increase and utilize your space? Uh, a TikTok influencer can hop on right now, get a product, and now all of a sudden the demand for that product skyrockets. So how does the supply chain plan for that? How are you able to pull that data to what Paul just said, right? How are you able to pull that data and say, hey, uh, I need to source more widgets to make this product because the demand for this now overnight. When, when, so how, how can I create such a flexible supply chain so that I can quickly react to all of these unpredictable uh, demands that could spike up over day? Uh, customer satisfaction at the end of the day, right? And, where maximizing, if you will, or optimizing your warehouse space and your transportation uh, to be able to reach those demands. So I think those factors are going to continue to play uh, a change and, and drive the need for technology so that we can uh, meet that ever-changing demand from the customer. No, and then you, uh, great response, uh, Dennis, and you covered two very important aspects in your response, right? One is the supply chain visibility to be able to you know, so your customer knows where their order is at any point of time, and you as a business know where your product is. You know, what are the what are the bottlenecks? Where is my raw material? Where is my order? You know, so that I am aware at any point of time what's happening. So that's your end-to-end -end supply chain visibility. That's one aspect of it, and the other aspect, as you mentioned, like my demand forecasting, right? What type of demand for? You know, where where what would be the demand from my customer next week, next month? You know, next quarter. And how do I get my product closer to where the customer is? You know, I think Amazon has done a great job of kind of, so, you know, I don't think they've solved the problem 100%, but they've done a great, great job of getting the product closer to their customer, right? But what sort, and this is open to the panel, uh, what sort of tools and technologies do you use, one, for supply chain visibility, and two, for demand forecasting, two of the, you know, uh, greatest or uh, aspects of any sort of supply chain and logistics uh, business and they, i mean feel free to take up uh, you know anyone feel free to take up that question uh, just that's a, a curiosity from my part in terms of the challenges challenges that you have seen in those two aspects and what sort of tools and technology you use to address some of this uh, you know some of these issues i can uh, i can pop in and just you know a little bit of what dennis was saying around I think that customer experience is always evolving and, and getting better. And, you know, I'll hearken this back to an easy earlier conversation of what I would build and what I would buy. But um, that customer experience platform is one that I've built in the past and I strongly believe in because to Dennis's point, it's always changing how people interact, what they need to know. So I think owning that technology and being able to to, you know, constantly keep it fresh and a new experience for the customer is important. I think that also connects back to um, a, a strong mobile program. Um, and so I don't want to be a one trick for me. I'm also going to say that uh, demand forecasting, I mean, having a strong data warehouse with historical trends um, couple, coupled with, you know, whatever's going on in the industry. I don't know if anyone's done a steep analysis, but, you know, when you evaluate um, sociocultural, technological, environmental, economic, and political factors, and just really making sure you've got a, a finger on the pulse of what's going on in your ecosystem, couple that with big data, you know, some some research, I think you can get a really good sense of demand forecasting and, and where you need to put um, some of your focus as as time evolves. So that would be my quick answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, I could jump in and share some of my experience here from my past, right? Working for one of the uh, larger, larger retailers of the world, if you were for Walmart. Uh, at the time in the facility where I was working at, we introduced what was called a vehicle management system, right? So as we looked into constantly optimizing our, our path, pick path, and then uh, to, to what Kurt said, right? Bringing the product closer to the customer so that we can, or uh, increasing the ability of getting the product picked, shipped, delivered, uh, received, or cross stock, whatever that opportunity was, we introduced this, uh, this, this uh, vehicle management systems and, and going back to the original piece, right? When we introduced that to the team, everybody thought, here they go, they're not tracking me, right? They're not tracking every move. And yes, we wanted to track and we wanted to see that pick path of that equipment and how far it was driving on a 1.2 million square foot warehouse. And not just that, but then we wanted to kind of bring the team together and say, hey, here's what the data is saying, right? Get the users, get those ones that are, are, are operating it and say, Here's, here's the wasted movements, right? 
what can we do now to bring that product closer to the shipping dock? What can we do to bring it to the receiving dock or, or let that data, visualized data, right? Being able to say, here's what your path is. Uh, and, and it was a great tool, right? Once it got put into a weekly data and you could track one equipment going back and forth, you could, but the employees themselves were coming back and saying, you know what? I wasted so much time, right? My forks were empty from point A to point B. I didn't even have any products. So that's a non-value add. Yeah. So the, the, the use of technology on that particular instance gave us the ability to come back and empower that operator or that worker to say, hey, uh, well, I think that we can do this, or I think that we can do that to be able to be more productive, more efficient, and be able to do more with less. Thank you, thank you, Denise. Paul, would you like to add some of your own experience along those lines? Uh, yes, um, I actually dealt with the dealing with the pickup as well, but uh, not to just reiterate the same the same project, but to add an additional project I actually dealt with was the RFID project, right? So essentially, what it kind of dealt with was um, the RFIDs being able to um, track to see when the incoming trade was coming in, how long it would take to actually to get to the location, and actually allowing the person to actually search for the trailer in a, in a more timely manner. Uh, when we did an analysis on it, we actually found that we had a one-year payback because of the amount of wasted time. People had to go searching for trailers, moving trailers because of issues that was occurring. Some of the issues that occurred actually dealt with um, people typing in the wrong information into the system, um, which we actually were able to uh, error proof by having them to take a picture of the trailer as it comes in. Once that once that actually occurred, then we would, then it actually transposed the information and put it into the system properly. So there, technology is a, is is really used to be an aid to Tokyo most 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 situations. So that's one of the projects I've made. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, so we have a few questions from the from the attendees, and I believe Kirk. I see that you have typed in responses to some of those. So uh, Nitin, how do we handle those questions from the audiences? Do you uh, do you uh, do you want to kind of elaborate on those uh, on those responses? Um, because so that every everyone is aware what those questions are and what the response is. Yes, please do, Dvi. I'm sure you know. Uh, you can just go ahead with the questions, and uh, in case any other panel members want to add any view, you can do that. Sure. So, so one of the questions uh, was a little more elaboration on why you will buy off-the-shelf TMS. You know, so that's a very specific question asking about why do you buy an off-the-shelf off-the-shelf TMS. So, and Kirk has typed in a response. So, Kirk, would you like to elaborate on this for the benefit of other attendees? Sure. And one of the things I didn't add, so first of all, they're huge. <laughs> it's a lot of work and a lot of years. I'm not sure that's a good use of effort when there's other uh, technologies within the ecosystem that are faster and provide more value. So really, to me, it's just a processing system. So I, I, I don't think you get a huge competitive advantage through a TMS um, in its uh, most basic form. I think where you get the advantage are all the technologies that surround it. And then through the process of abstraction, right, just having a good integration layer and being able to build custom technology that feeds it, I think that's where you get a lot more innovation. So um, I know I've been in companies where we built our own TMSs and, you know, people swear by them and they think they're the greatest thing ever. But at the end of the day, you end up having a large team to manage it and you're not getting the value for the cost that you're putting into it. But if you get um, other technologies around it that integrate properly um, because it takes less, less work to manage, and you get more value. I just see that as a better investment. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, Dennis or Paul, what's your perspective? Uh, so in general, right, not just for the TMS piece, but if you're looking into buying or versus building, um, I think again, keeping the end in mind and, and looking at the large picture, oftentimes we're solving for an immediate uh, so, or for an immediate problem. And we tend to, uh, whether it's customer pressure, whether it's demand, or whether it's something needs to happen because we're losing service or our brand is being bruised because of lack of service, we tend to jump into the, uh, I know somebody that's going to build that for us, right? And then here it is. 
and oftentimes that could come with limitations because we haven't looked into what is our next 10 year plan right, to grow our, our business, if you will. So I'd say part of the decision process, if you will, to buy versus build would be to truly do a strategic uh, approach and say, here's what our vision is long term. Here's what we need short term. And, and could that be a combination maybe of we're going to buy? while we're working on building and here's uh here's how we're going to support it a lot of the builds that i've been a uh, part of have been so catered to that process so that when when we try to latch on to another uh, company that transmission did not necessarily happen fluidly because of all the customization that we had done and all the time and energy and dollars that were invested to it people didn't want to let go on it right they said no we're going to continue to build on it because of all that investment that was done versus just saying, cut it off, let's start you with something else. Thank, thank you, thank you, Dennis. Yeah, I think everybody kind of answered the, the question, but, and just to kind of piggyback on what everybody said, but I would also like to add that, you know, by creating those win-win situations, you're able to develop a synergy with, the, with your team. And that helps to improve your technology so with your, your tms if for me i, I feel like if you're going to do a buy off the shelf you need to truly understand your your current process to see if it's actually feasible um a lot of the times that because when you do a, a true analysis of your current process you'll find out that there are going to be some type of customization that's going to be thank you thank you Paul. I believe the next question was uh, for, well, I, uh, you know, it's open to the panel anyway, but there's a question about how can logistics companies effectively manage and leverage the vast amount of data generated by emerging technologies? Uh, so this is very, very specific technical questions. Um, Kark, I know you have typed in a response. You want to elaborate on that for the benefit of the attendees? Yeah, no, I just, I, I build a few data warehouses and I just find the technology has been evolving at a good, good clip. Um, I think it works great. And I think, uh, I'm, you know, um, I think it's not just about getting the tech in place, but having the right creative minds, leveraging the technology to ask questions and really dig in and, and pull out answers for the organization. So I think it's a combo of there's good, good tech out there that you can use and finding the right people to, to use it is probably the other big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, uh, and I will just to pick it, I think for me, just to piggyback off that, I definitely agree with that thought process. I think that we just need to make sure that we have the correct data ownership um, involved as well as make sure that we have the people that can use, actually interpret that data properly. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Dennis, would you like to add something from your perspective to that question? Yeah, I think again, uh, when it comes to data, right, is uh, one thing to have data. Oftentimes, uh, Paul mentioned the uh, analysis paralysis earlier on, right? So it's being able to, uh, again, look at it at a, from a scale point of view and peeling yourself back and saying, what is it that we're solving for? What data serves us and what data does not serve us? And being able to segregate the two and uh, again follow through with the 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 why and what what is it the customer is asking to kind of walk that back and say uh how is this data integrated how uh how can i filter through it and have some good business analysts in place in any, in any department so that they can present that data in a manner that uh, it has value thank you thank you denise so so Nathan, i think we are towards the end of uh, end of our um, webinar we uh i don't think i don't see any other questions from the attendees so i'll hand it over to you yeah. Nathan, to kind of summarize no and if you have any other questions. questions from your side as well sure thank you Didi. thank you thank you for you know moderating this great panel discussion and thanks to dennis kirk and paul you know for making this a very interesting one and i'm sure the audience must have taken a lot from this uh, great panel discussion just now we witnessed so just to wrap up we would like to thank our community partners speakers and attendees who came together for enriching knowledge through this forum 
as I rightly said, we had some great set of panel speakers who came together to share their thoughts. Just for your information, today's event was broadcasted in the YouTube page of our company. So all of you can go and see the recording anytime. Please log on to our website and like the social media channels. We'll be sharing lots of knowledge sharing topics, details, announcement of next events, and much more, which will help you register and attend the same. Also, we would like to thank InfoVision, which is our knowledge and innovation partner, and Digit7, which is our technology partner. To understand more in depth and connect with them, all of you can go through their website, which is infovision.com, and closely liaison with them. Further, there are lots more in store for this year with focus on banking, financial insurance, telecom, retail, healthcare, supply chain, manufacturing, energy, utility, and so on. So request all of you to keep connected with us and enjoy the learning. Thanks and do take good care of yourself. Have a lovely day and great week ahead. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you, everyone. Kirk, Dennis, Paul, it has been an amazing uh, you know, discussion. Thank you for your insights. I personally, you know, learned a lot. And um, 